Got the devil on my throat. Got blood on my hand. The ones that I love are in danger. I'm Good morning. My name is Eric. If we haven't met, I just want to welcome you to Susquehanna Valley Church this morning. We're so glad that you've uh, chosen to worship with us here this morning. If you're watching online, we're happy to have you tuning in with us. We'd love to hear from you. If you have a prayer request or something like that, just uh, drop us an email. We'd, we'd love to connect with you in that way. A um, couple of things to draw our attention to just this morning before we, we get into our worship time. Uh, so. Yesterday, we were supposed to have a bunch of kids running around finding eggs and all sorts of stuff. Um, that didn't happen. It would have been a very soggy, cold Easter egg hunt. So we're rescheduled that to next Saturday. Uh, or not next, this coming Saturday, as in six days from now, whatever that is. Um, we're going to need uh, some help. If you were signed up to help out yesterday and you're able to help out this week, uh, that would be great. But we do have some folks that were able to help out yesterday who are not able to help out this week. So if, if your schedule is open for this Saturday and you would like to help out with the Easter egg hunt, please touch base with Rachel um, in the kids' ministry wing or actually any of us, and we'll point you in that direction. Um, we have our Good Friday service on Friday. This Friday, uh, March 29th, 6.30 p.m. And it's going to be a wonderful time of uh, coming before uh, our Lord together and, and just worshiping what he did for us on that cross. Children are going to be welcome to be part of our worship service for the beginning part. Um, we're going to have communion together as families, and then we will have uh, a children's program for children, um, nursery through fifth grade. April 7th will be, we've moved our baptism service to April 7th, so there's still time if you are if, if God has done a work in your life and you have committed yourself to following Jesus Christ but you've never been baptized and you would like to uh, do, do that public proclamation of your faith, um, we would love to talk to you about that. You can talk to Pastor Matt, myself, or Pastor Jesse, uh, and, and we would love to talk to you some more about that. That's going to be on April 7th. Coming up on May 4th is the May Fair at Southside Elementary School. We've, we've been able to develop this relationship with Southside Elementary for the past several years, um, ministering to the people in that community. Um, and uh, May 4th is their May Fair, and we've been able to help them out with that event. It's a huge event, so if you like running games, playing with kids, um, engaging with kids in that way, and just ministering, showing them that, hey, there's a church that loves you, we would love to have you join us for that. Just sign up for that on our website. And uh, on April 28th is our Next Gen Commitment service. Next Gen Commitment, is, some people call it baby dedication or whatever. Um, we call it our Next Gen Commitment service. Uh, we have a passion, obligation for the next generation. And, and for those parents with young children, babies, who, who want to commit those, raising those children, to the Lord and with the church's support around them, we're going to have that service on April 28th. So if you are a parent of a young child who and you would like to participate in that, um, go ahead and sign up for that on our website, and we would love to talk to you about that. As we begin our time of worship together, I'm going to invite you to stand as we pray together. Lord, we come before you today to sing praises to you, to lift up our hearts to you, to be spoken to and challenged by you. Lord, we come to worship. And we just pray, Lord, that our worship would be a sweet offering to you and that you would mold us and shape us in this time. Amen. You know, often we will uh, read a scripture passage before we sing our first song, but we're kind of singing a very famous scripture passage. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should have everlasting life. So let's sing that together. No more 
His mercy Come to the table Be well satisfied Taste of His goodness Find what you're looking for For God so loved The world that He gave us His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in
child Yeah, let's sing that again And I'm no longer a slave
Father, we're so thankful that we can try. We're so thankful that we can express as a church together the absolute glory and splendor of what you did, Father. Lord, I pray today as as Pastor Jesse comes to speak to us that you would just move through us. Lord, that you would you would touch hearts, Lord, that you would remove barriers that places that have been locked up and held, held separate, Lord, will be open to you. Thank you, Father, for the chance to be here together as a body and as a family. In your name I pray. Amen. Have you, have you ever done something that you, with a crowd of people that you're, you're like, I would never have done that on my own? Like, if, you, if there's, maybe there's a moment getting caught up or swept up in a, in a crowd, and you're thinking, I, I wouldn't have done that if, it were, if I were by myself. Um, there was a, a few years back, I went to a, a football game. It was the Philadelphia Eagles against the New York Giants. And it was in New York, and I, I'm an Eagles fan. Um, probably hear more about that later from you all, <laughs> depending on where you stand on that. Um, but I remember going to this game, and it was in New York, and so I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to run into. And there, there were a lot of Eagles fans there, a lot of Giants fans. And, and um, there was a moment where there was some tension in our section in the crowd, and I could, I could sense this, like, tension kind of building. And it was, like, leading towards, like, altercations between people. And, and I remember one of the Giants fans stood up, and he was like, Hey, everybody, let's, let's calm down. Like, we know who the real enemy is. It's the Cowboys. <laughs> and, and then he started, like, a chant with, like, a kind of a derogatory word in there about the Cowboys, and it just spread like wildfire through our whole section. And I kind of was, like, s- smiling a little bit to myself, and I was like, I kind of want to join in, and yet it's not really a phrase I would ever say on my own, right? Like, it's not something you would say just without the the push and the pull of the crowd. And I don't know if you've ever been in that position, you think, why did I do that? Or maybe, maybe there was something that you know you should have done, something you know you should have said, but the pull of the crowd kind of kept you quiet in that moment. So whether it's something that you did that you shouldn't have done or something that you didn't do that you should have done, we've, I think we've all experienced some of the dynamics that take place when a crowd gathers. 
And most of us are aware of the, the power of social media over the last 15, 20 years or so. It's been uh, something that's built uh, up. And one of the things about social media is, is it reveals that we're just social creatures, that we have a need to connect to other people. Unless you're like a complete hermit, like leave me alone, that you have a need, whether you're introvert or extrovert or you enjoy social media, you don't, that there is a need within us to connect to other people. And, 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 and this is revealed, it's just part of who we are. It's actually revealed in scripture that this is true of who we are, that from the very beginning of the story, from Adam and Eve, our first parents, through the Old Testament people of God up until the New Testament church, into the book of Revelation. So from beginning to end, scripture reveals that we, we have a need for one another. We have a need for other people. It's part of the way that God designed us, that, that we have a spiritual need, we have a social need, and, and in all these ways the scripture shows, these two things connect. And, and the scripture is really interested in, in showing us how to do life together in a group of people, but to do it God's way. We also see in our nature that the things that we care about, the things that we desire, the things that we, we love have, a, have a, 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 in a way, mimic the desires and loves and the cares of the people around us. And this is so true when I'm watching my young children. Um, my four-year-old has no interest in a toy until, until his, four, or his three-year-old sister has it, right? Like, there's nothing that you had no interest in, now you, you really, really want that. But it's not just true for, for young children, it's true for teenagers, for young adults, middle-aged, all, all the way up through. Um, it's just true of who we are as, as people. I think it's why in Scripture, one of the Ten Commandments from the Old Testament, and there's, there's ten things, it seems like these are very important things, right? One of them is that you should not covet. And it, and it seems like a little bit, like a look at that, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but you look at it, you're like, it feels a little bit, out of proportion to the other commandments, like don't murder, don't steal, don't lie, don't, 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 um, don't create an idol, all these things. Like those are pretty big deals. What, like is it such a big deal that I want what some, someone else wants or what someone else has? In the 5th century, um, a man named St. Augustine, he was onto something, I think, when he said that, that sin causes our loves to become disordered. That sin disorders our desires, the things that we love, the things that we care about, it, it distorts them. Now what happens when sin and those distorted desires then rub up against the distorted desires and the people around us? A couple years ago, someone um, within Facebook kind of blew the whistle on how the algorithms were working. I don't know if you caught up with this story. But this person inside Facebook saw how the algorithms within the, the platform work to kind of boost some negative or angry or harmful rhetoric. That the, the stuff that was kind of demeaning or cruel kind of got a boost because uh, more and more people started interacting with it and it kind of pushed it to the forefront. It seemed to kind of create a negative feedback loop within the platform. And the, whistle, uh, the whistleblower at Facebook was kind of implicating Facebook in this, in this and, and there's probably some truth to that. But I don't know how much the algorithms really deserve to take the blame for this because it's really in our sin nature to gravitate towards a cruelty towards other people. And if we're social creatures, if we're inclined to engage with one another, and if our desires and our loves, the things that we care about or the things that we hate, are so deeply influenced by the loves and desires and the hates of the people around us, and if sin has really infiltrated every heart, then I'm not sure that a social media platform really takes all the blame when an echo chamber of cruelty can be created within its platform. The reality is that sin is like a lion that seeks to devour us, but it is so often like a lion that's kind of waiting behind the bushes and hiding, and we're unaware of its dangers. We're often blind to the desires that we all have, and we're not very good at self-awareness. It's not like we're, we're dumb. It's just that we don't see it. We need God's help to be aware of it. So these sinful desires, that, that come, they, they come into contact with the sinful desires of, of others, of other people. And we begin to want what they want and vice versa, and it kind of creates a feedback loop. And then it soaks a fire of a collective will towards sinful intent. And this collective will can be a very powerful and destructive thing. This is the, the final week that we're in a series. We're looking at the trials of Jesus after his arrest and then leading up to his crucifixion. 
After he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus faced several trials, one bef- some before the religious leaders. And those religious leaders said, he's guilty of blasphemy. He's, he's making himself out to be the son of God. What more proof do we need? We need to, to kill this man. So they bring him before the Roman leaders, the political authorities, because they don't have the power to kill him under their, their own authority. So they bring him before the, the Roman leaders, and the Roman leaders are ruled by, by Roman law, and they look at Jesus and they say, it doesn't look like he's committed anything worthy of death. So they, they don't carry out the, the death sentence uh, based on their own laws. And then the last trial that we're looking at this morning, it's kind of not really a trial all, at all because it's, it's really these groups of people bringing Jesus before the crowd. And as we see, there's legal questions going back and forth. And this morning, we're looking at this scene of Jesus before a crowd of people on Good Friday. Now, if you're familiar with the story of the Passion Week, you know that today marks um, Palm Sunday, right? So it's something that, that is very built into our, our, um, our calendar, the Christian calendar. It's recognized as the Sunday before Jesus' crucifixion. On that day, a crowd of Jesus' disciples, they caused this stir in the city of Jerusalem as Jesus is entering the city. And when Jesus enters the city, he came on the back of a donkey. So he's coming humbly. But that's a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy about the Messiah who would humbly come. In the Gospel of Matthew, he's going to quote from the Old Testament book of Zechariah. So written hundreds of years before Jesus comes onto the scene. And what Matthew's doing is he's connecting the dots for us that would have been obvious to the people there in the crowd on on Palm Sunday. And it says this in Zechariah 9.9, Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the crowd of, of disciples is laying out this kind of red carpet. They're laying down palm branches, and they're shouting Hosanna, which Hosanna means save us. And they're calling Jesus the son of David, is that he's in the line of King David, the Messiah who would come to save his people. The religious leaders are there on the scene, and they're like getting frustrated with this situation. Um, but Jesus is actually encouraging his disciples to, to worship him in this way. And, and it's kind of an, uh, an unusual, unusual thing for Jesus to do, because up until that point, a lot of the times he's downplaying his identity as the Messiah. He, he, people are, are picking up the clues on who he is, and, and he's saying, you need to be quiet about that. Because he knew that when his, his identity as the Messiah would, was fully revealed, it would set the wheels in motion, leading to his appearance before another crowd only five days later. But the events of those five days between Palm Sunday and then the altercation before the crowd on Good Friday are important. During those five days, Jesus did some pretty amazing things that confounded a lot of people. Jesus cleansed the temple by casting out those who were abusing it for financial gain. He told a parable, Pastor Matt referred to this a couple weeks back, about a vineyard. And in this parable, the religious leaders were actually opposed to God's kingdom. He told people that they should pay taxes to Caesar as Caesar required, but then to give to God what God required. He elevated this poor widow who had given all she had while also kind of diminishing the grandeur and the beauty of the temple. He taught about the future, not the now. He said that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. He challenged those who wanted to be the greatest in the kingdom. And then the night that Jesus was arrested, and this is kind of an amazing thing, he he rebuked his disciples for two things. He rebuked them for sleeping through prayer and then for mobilizing for violence. And in all of these events, from Sunday to Friday, it became clearer and clearer that Jesus was operating with an entirely different kingdom in mind. The salvation that he would bring was a salvation that was spiritual, not purely physical. And what do we do when Jesus doesn't operate the way that we think that he should? Like, I have a way that I think this should go. I have a way that I think the world should operate. What happens when Jesus doesn't do that? And then what happens when when that that view of what Jesus should do kind of comes into contact with the disordered desires, the disordered views of the people around us? This morning we see that what happened with Jesus in the crowd. It's a group of people there, it says in the Gospel of Matthew that they were provoked by the religious leaders. They're also urged on by their own desires, stoked by one another. 
eager to shout for Jesus to be crucified. But before we look into Luke 23, won't you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we, we, we come before you humbly looking at this passage. It's familiar to some of us and unfamiliar to others. And as we look into it, I pray that you would give us fresh eyes to see it, um, to apply it in, in our lives this morning. And Lord, we would be amazed at, at, at what Jesus has done through his death on the cross. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 23. Starting verse 13 through 17, it says this, Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers of the people and the people and said to them, you brought this man to me as one who, who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. No, nor has Herod, for he sent him back to, to us. And behold, nothing deserving death has been done by him. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. Now, he was obliged to release to them at the feast one prisoner. I don't know if you've ever been part of like a collective crowd kind of gathering all for one purpose. You join from varying experiences and backgrounds, and, and you come together, and you might have some push and pull within the group. Uh, maybe it's at a, a, a town meeting or a, a school meeting or some of those types of, of events. There was a, a couple years back when we were living down in Florida, or not Florida, <laughs> I wish. I've never lived in Florida. Um, when I was living, we were living down in Maryland, and we were in a small town called Charlestown. And, and you know, living in a town of about 1,000 people, there's, a, there's town, monthly town meetings. And in the grand scheme of things, like the things that are covered in a town, it was like something from Stars Hollow, if you know that reference. But it was like, these are not that important of issues, but in a town of that many people, it was like, these are really important issues, right? And um, so you're always kind of looking at the agenda and what's on the agenda. And so when something kind of, oh, I'm, I'm interested in that, you go to one of the meetings. And I went to um, the one meeting because I saw on the agenda that was sent out through our email um, that one of the things on the, on the agenda was that some people were having problems with their neighbors regarding their chickens. And I, I thought, okay, this is, inter this is of interest to me because we had chickens. And so I was like, oh, I better go and see kind of the issues that are at play here. And I went, and there were about 20 of us in a room, and we, we were sitting down. And before the meeting started, I talked to a woman who was sitting next to me. I'd never met her before. Um, I said, you know, is there something on the agenda that you're interested in, in, in finding out more information or you want to speak to? And she said, what do you think? I said, um, and I, I kind of had a hunch, but I was like, I, I don't know. Like, she said, it's the chickens. And she said, she went on and on. She said, you know, my neighbor has ducks and chickens and dogs and goats, and, and they don't clean up after them, and there's, their property's right next to ours, and the smell is going back and forth, and it's just awful, and she kept like rolling on and on about this, and then she kind of stood back, and she said, what are you, what are you interested in here? I, I have chickens. <laughs> and, she, and she was like, oh, okay. Like, it, it, it kind of took her back, and it was an interesting meeting. It was a give, give and take back and forth, but we were all gathered together for this purpose, we were trying to arrive at a consensus, even in our disagreements. Verse 13 in, in Luke 23 sets the, the scene for the crowd, that there's these governmental, these political leaders, and they're, they're there, and the crowd is there, the, the religious leaders are there, there's, there's people that are, have traveled into the city uh, for this religious and cultural festival of the Passover that's taking place in the city. And then don't, don't forget, in the middle of this, that Jesus is there too. And it's interesting because he kind of gets he kind of gets like pushed to the margins in the story because all the hustle and, and and arguments going back and forth, but Jesus is there and he's the most important person on the scene. The charges against Jesus are described by Pilate in verse 14. He's incited the people to rebellion. And the Greek word for incite is to steer, to turn, to twist. So Jesus is being tried for steering, for twisting, for turning this crowd towards a, a rebellion. And this would have been a serious offense to Pilate if it, if it had been true, right? The Pilate would have an interest in finding out more about this. But, but Pilate uses legal language, and he says that he's examined. That word examined is a, is a legal word. He's examined Jesus and has found no guilt in him. He also says that Herod also looked at him. And there's, he didn't find anything guilty, deserving death either. Now, Pilate's intention then was to, to, to punish Jesus, 
Now, Pilate was ruling by Roman law. Nothing in the law condemned Jesus to death. But, but Pilate, I think, is sensing himself being pushed into a corner in this scene. But before we're tempted to feel any kind of sympathy towards Pilate, I want us to kind of see his situation for what it is. He's not really concerned about Jesus' safety. He's simply playing all the cards that he has in his hand in the midst of this situation. He wants to keep the peace. That's what he's trying to do. So he's tried to pass the buck to Herod. That's a card he played. Pastor Eric touched on that last week. It didn't really work. He plans to beat Jesus. Maybe that's the card to be played to kind of calm the situation. But the last card in his pocket is a custom that allowed him to release one prisoner at the feast in order to keep the peace with the crowd. Look at, look at verse 18 and 23. As we're seeing the crowd's response, Pilate has pretty much said, this, this man's innocent. Now how is the, the crowd going to respond? But they cried out all together, saying, Away with this man, and release for us Barabbas. He was one who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection made in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again. But they kept on calling out, saying, Crucify Crucify him. And he said to them the third time, Why, what evil has this man done? I have found no guilt demanding death. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. But they were insistent with loud voices asking that he be crucified, and their voices began to prevail. I think there's significance here in the, in the number three. The three times Pilate attempts to release Jesus while the crowd continues to push back for the release of Barabbas and the crucifixion of Jesus. It's not the first time we see the number three. It won't be the last time we see it appearing in these scenes. In the middle of the night before, or probably sometime earlier that morning, Peter, who's one of, one of Jesus' closest followers, is, 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 denies Jesus while he's huddled with a crowd around a fire. Is there anything more kind of comforting or... or or just, just, you know, it puts you at ease as being around a fire, right, with, with a group of other people. But Peter's lulled into the will of the crowd. He's driven to reject Jesus, to deny him. He's feeling, sensing this fear of being known as one of Jesus' disciples. And then the next day, for three days after this crucifixion, Jesus would stay dead. And then each of these things, these echoes of three, their significance is seen in, in the, 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 the insistence of evil, of violence, of sin to win the day. But in each instance, instance, those things would be overcome by the power, the mercy, and the love of God. So the crowd is insist, they're, they're insistent, but they're also inconsistent in their demands. And it seems like they're ignorant of the darkness of their desires. They, they push forward for their demands. They're encouraged by the religious leaders. They're forcing Pilate into a position of being held captive by this mob rule. And the final card that Pilate can play is to release a criminal. And the criminal was actually being held for some of the very things that the, the crowd wants to indict Jesus for. And we don't know much about Barabbas. His name means son of rabbi. Or a, or a teacher's son. It's a Jewish name, so he's likely um, part of the Jewish community. And the text tells us that he was a known criminal. He was someone who had actually provoked the crowds towards insurrection. He was a murderer. And it's difficult to kind of gauge the crowd's motives here because they want to release Barabbas, but then they want to crucify Jesus for some of the very things, such as inciting an insurrection. But they demand of someone the release of someone who did that exact same thing. And perhaps Barabbas was actually the leader that they, they actually wanted. Someone who sought to overthrow the Roman rule, who was using whatever means necessary to get what he wanted, something that, that was becoming more and more obvious that Jesus was not interested in doing. But what's most amazing to me as this scene is unfolding, what's most amazing to me about this situation is that for all the spats, the fights, the differences between the, the religious leaders and the political leaders between the Jewish people and the Roman people, that in this moment, they're all on the same team. They're all wanting the same thing. They all seek to keep the peace, to maintain the status quo. They're all elevating the kingdoms of this earth over and above the kingdom of God. And they're so blind to this reality, the reality of what they're doing that Jesus, only a few verses later in the Gospel of Luke, in a statement of sheer grace as he's hanging on the cross, prays to God and says, Father, forgive them, 
if they do not know what they are doing. And I've always been perplexed by this prayer. I don't know if you've heard that prayer before. Like, why would Jesus pray that? Like, shouldn't it have been obvious to the people who were, who were killing him what they were doing, that, that what they were doing was wrong? But again, how often are we unaware of the reality of sinful motivations in our hearts? How often do we side with the kingdoms of this world over and against the kingdom of God? And Jesus' prayer reveals the depth of his grace toward us. And we talk at SVC a lot about being a source of grace. And this, this is grace in its purest form that Jesus is forgiving those who murdered him from the cross. And I wonder if we can see that, how does that impact the way that we interact with other people? And his forgiveness acknowledges that wrong has been done. That's what forgiveness does. But how does this impact the way we engage with forgiveness with one another? So the crowd continues to demand the exchange. They want Barabbas to go free, and they want Jesus to die. But this isn't just a demand for freedom for one man and then punishment for the other. This is a demand to include one man back into the fold, even while expelling the other from their midst. Just as Jesus sought the company of that, that small crowd around a fire, not wishing to be excluded, so Barabbas is then being welcomed back into the community. But in order for that to happen, someone needed to be sent away. This isn't just an issue of substitution. So we talk about substitutionary atonement. It's a big theological concept um, where one, one person is substituted, sacrificed for another. This is a, a social reality with relationships and, and emotional connections between people. And there's an explanation for this that so often is within the whole revelation of God's word in the Old Testament. Now, if you've ever read the book of Leviticus, I'm going to go there. <laughs> if it can be a, a little bit heavy, it can be a little bit dense. Um, it's full of, of rituals and sacrifices and rules and all these things, and it can be easy to kind of feel bogged down in the detail that it contains. But we believe that all of God's word is important, that all of it has a purpose. And there's this section in the book of Leviticus that I think sheds light on the scene of Barabbas before the crowd. In Leviticus chapter 16, there's a certain kind of sacrifice described on what is called the Day of Atonement. The, sacri the sacrifice involved two different goats, both of whom would represent the sins and the wrongs of the people. The one goat would be killed. Its blood would be shed and sprinkled throughout the, the, the tabernacle or the temple. That's a substitute the kind of sacrifice that it, even though it's like a bit culturally removed from where we're at, we can understand what it means. That, that Paul talks about in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul says that the wages of sin is death. So for, to pay for that, that's the wages of sin, something has to die. And the New Testament book of Hebrews says that, that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. It talks about that there is life in the blood. So some, something had to die in the place of something, something else. We understand that. So that's the one goat. But then the other one had a different function. The priest would take that goat and place his hands on its head as a symbol of the transfer of sin and guilt away from the people and onto the goat. And then the goat would be sent away alive into a remote place, into a wilderness. And I think it's important to ask, why was this necessary? Like, what, what function did this have? Hadn't the death of the one goat already dealt with the problem of sin? But I think what we're seeing is that the people needed to see their guilt leave the camp. They needed to see it removed from a social setting and then sent into a place where people don't live. And God provided a way for people to see that guilt removed, to have an image of it, to, to see it leaving their midst. And when the Bible was first being translated into English, a new word came into our language to kind of capture the identity of this animal. That's the scapegoat. It's the goat that is sent away that's removed from the community. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus is often called the Lamb of God, right? He's never called the goat of God. I recognize that. Uh, but when Jesus was exchanged for Barabbas, when one man was welcomed back into the community and the other was removed from the camp, sent away out of the city to a place called Golgotha, which is called the place of the skull, we see this kind of scapegoat mechanism taking place. And it's a word, scapegoat that we use in our culture because it's something that's always been with us. 
There's always been something in us that seeks to, 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 to place our own worst tendencies, our own motivations, and cast them onto the back of someone else. And when that desire then comes into contact with others around us, it becomes only stronger and stronger. Now, it's not as simple as saying that, that Jesus took Barabbas' place. That seems to be what happened. But the deeper reality is that when, was that, that Barabbas was welcomed and Jesus was rejected. And this was a social reality. It was, some, it was an event that reflected the power of the crowd, even a crowd that, that's being manipulated. It reveals that we will accept evil in our midst if it means we get what we want in the end. If it maintains the status quo or keeps the peace, it reveals that we can find someone to blame when our expectations go unmet, when our desires go unfulfilled, and when we are unaware of the reality of the sin in our hearts. So there's this back and forth between Pilate and the crowd. Pilate, he, he finds no justification in Roman law to execute Jesus, but he's playing his final card, the potential release of a criminal. And for Pilate, who is the, who is the greater threat to peace in this situation? That you have this notorious insurrectionist and murderer who's wanted by the people, or this other man who claims to be a king of another kingdom, but a kingdom that seems to have no political power. And he, he, he's kind of faced with this reality of what he's, he's ma- wanting to do. Maybe the crowd in that moment doesn't really understand what they're asking for. They don't see the bigger picture of God's kingdom. But we're asked wh- whose voice will win out in the end, the political leader or the crowd. There's a, a, a writer who writes about leadership, James Burns. He asks this question, which I think is relevant to this text. Who are the leaders and who are the led? Who is leading whom to where? For what purposes, with what results? We see the results in verses 24 and 25. And Pilate pronounced sentence that their demand be granted. And and he released the man they were asking for, who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. But he delivered Jesus to their will. In the end, Pilate bows to the demands of the crowd. He releases Barabbas and delivers Jesus over to be crucified. If Pilate had wanted to do the right thing, he could have. But for Pilate, Jesus wasn't really worth his time. And the lines in the end, the lines between the Pilate, the religious leaders, and the crowd end up dissolving. And one commentator, James Edwards, puts it this way. He says, in the end, the power and authority of the Roman prefect and the mob incited by the religious leaders are one. So the powers at work in the kingdoms of this world unite against the one true king. But even as Jesus was innocent before this chorus calling for his execution, he's not an arbitrarily chosen victim of the crowd. This isn't some kind of random or haphazard situation. The one who stood quietly in the midst of this crowd stood firmly on the plans of God in the end. And and, in the book of Acts, in chapter 4, so the book of Acts takes place after Jesus' crucifixion, after his resurrection, and he's ascended into heaven, and then the church begins in Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John, these early followers of Jesus, had been arrested and then released. They had been preaching about Jesus. They had done miracles in his name. And after they're released, they, they say something that has just the full force and the power of the revelation of God at work on this scene that we looked at this morning. Acts chapter 4 Starting in verse 24, it says, they say these words. It says, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, and then they're going to quote from Psalm, Psalm 2, written thousands, or hundreds of years before Jesus. And this is what Psalm 2 said. Why did the Gentiles rage and the people devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. And they they add a little interpretation of that that passage from Psalm 2 in 27 and 28. They say, For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Peter and John, they point back to Psalm chapter 2, words of David written centuries ago, and they say that these plans that were devised by the kings, by the peoples, by the rulers, all gathered together, it points ahead to this this crowd that is going to gather and, and, and come against the anointed one, against the king, against the Messiah, the one who rules the true kingdom. And Peter and John connect this Old Testament passage to Good Friday. 
Their point is that, that all was part of God's plan. That on that day, Jesus quietly let the crowd and the rulers and the leaders devise their plans, knowing that, that they were unaware of their own desires for, to have and maintain kingdom. And Jesus quietly stands above it all, fully in command because of, of the plans of God. Now, in our response to this, you know, I'm closing, um, there's three words, I think, to kind of sum up a response to what we see with the crowd and Jesus that day. And these three words, I'll just share them with you. The first one, and our response to this is awareness. Awareness of the sin that kind of crouched in our own hearts, sin that might get stirred up even more so by the people around us. The reality is that it's, that it's there. You have a group of people in this scene unaware of, of the reality of what they're doing. But it's not only a crowd problem, it's, it's, a, it's a personal problem, right? The first John says that if we, if we say we have no sin, it says something really interesting about that mindset. It says we, def, we deceive ourselves. That this is the awareness that comes into play when we recognize our own sin. And really that's a gift of God to be aware of it. So an awareness. The second word, it's a little bit of a heavy word, but I think it's a good word, is lament. Lament is, is an Old Testament word. It talks about recognizing the reality of something very broken, right? And, and we're going to do that on Friday night. Good Friday it would be a, a really good opportunity to worship together and recognize that even we call it good because Jesus was the victor even on Good Friday, not just on Sunday. He was the victor on Good Friday. But we call it, we call it good even though it was the worst day ever, that it has ever happened, Right? And those two things are held in tension. We lament, and we can lament even now our desire to cast our own guilt onto the backs of someone who is innocent. There's no need to do this now. There's no need to do this to the people around us to cast our, our guilt and our shame on someone else because Jesus took it upon himself on Good Friday. But we can lament that. And then the third thing, the third word I, I want to leave you with is to, to sum up our response is awe that we worship the true king, that we stand in awe of the king who came riding on a donkey humbly into Jerusalem towards his own death. We stand, we stand in awe of a king who was betrayed and forsaken by his friends. When he was falsely accused, he did not retaliate, but he forgave. We, stay, we, we stand in awe and we worship a king who stayed calm while the people and the leaders devised all kinds of plans. And yet knowing that God was in control, that this was part of his plan. Won't you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for how it speaks uh, to us as individuals, how it can challenge us in our interactions with one another. I pray that as we, um, as we reflect on what it means to be aware of our sin, that you would bring those things into the, into the light that we need to confess before you so that you can and grant forgiveness as you freely do. I pray that we would um, lament um, the realities of Good Friday even as we rejoice in them. I pray that as, that as we think about um, what you have done, that we would be in awe of, of you, Lord Jesus, as a true king. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In just a second, church, we're going to stand together and sing a song that many of us know. Um, it's a song that we often bring out around Easter. So, um, when you hear it, you're like, yeah, okay. It's, it's called How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Um, and over the years, so, so several years ago, the worship team led this song, and in practice, we all kind of sat down and went, okay, well, what's the line that gets you uh, in this song? Because it's an extremely descriptive, story-like song. It tells a story of what it looked like to be in the crowd, and what amazes me is every year my answer to that question of what line gets me changes because there's so much in here. So this year I want to encourage you, um, you certainly find the line that gets you, but I'm going to share with you the line that gets me, especially in light of what Jesse shared, is the line that says, Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It can be tempting to say, um, that happened a long time ago. I, would be, I wouldn't be there. I wouldn't do that. It can be tempting to say that because we feel in our hearts that we don't want to be in that crowd. <laughs> but the reality is, 
We would be. At some point in our lives, we would have been standing in that crowd going, crucify him. Because we've got sin, we would be part of that crowd. There's just no way around it. And so as, as we sing today, please take a moment. If you're, not, if you're feeling like you just need a minute to reflect on the words, feel free to do that. If you want to stand, if you want to sit, I, 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 don't, I don't really care. I'm going to encourage you to stand, but please don't feel you have to. I do want to encourage you, take a moment to reflect on this scene to reflect on the moment when every voice, every single voice, demanded his death, including ours. Would you stand with me? How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one sons to glory behold man upon a cross my sin upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers of his grace and why we should gain from his reward I can't give an answer but this this I know with all my heart his wounds have paid my ransom a ransom for each and every one of us Like if, if God is stirring something in your heart if God is doing something and you would like to pray with someone we're going to have our prayer team they're going to be right up front here in front of the stage they would love to talk with you and to pray with you. You can talk to Pastor uh, Jesse or myself or Pastor Matt. Or if there's God stirring something else in your heart and, 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 and you just want someone to pray with, please feel free to come forward. We look forward to seeing you on Good Friday where we continue this and we come around the cross together. Until then. <laughs>